Sup, Chooms? Kept you all waiting, didn't I? Well, what happened is that I just got back from the Far East and uncovered some preem new deets from our research team located in Good Korea about an interesting theory regarding the subject of autophagy. So, what is autophagy? Well, Autophagy, what it is, it is a process in the cells that is kind of like our cells cleanup crew. What happens is that broken down and worn out proteins, as well as outdated components in the cells, are cleaned up and discarded by the autophagy mechanism. So a simple way to put it is that our cells over the course of many years get filled up with waste products that hasten cellular demise. Autophagy keeps the cells nice and clean so they can operate at peak efficiency, thus prolonging their life and in turn prolonging our life by making us more resistant to diseases that contribute to all-cause mortality, like cancer and neurodegenerative diseases like dementia. So one of the reasons we become more susceptible to diseases as we get older is because autophagy decreases with aging and therefore our risk of developing age-related diseases increases as we get older. The bad news though is that virtually every disease out there is age-related, so getting older is the biggest contributor to diseases, even more so than negative lifestyle factors like smoking and drinking. But as of today at least, there is nothing we can do to completely stop aging. However, there are ways to improve autophagy in spite of getting older and thus mitigate some of the damage that comes with aging. One method which has gained popularity in recent years is the lifestyle technique of intermittent fasting. So how does skipping a meal every now and then, which is what intermittent fasting is, help trigger autophagy? Well, as it turns out, autophagy is triggered by stress on the body. So contrary to popular belief, some stressors on the human organism are in fact good for you. Exercise, for instance, is a stressor on the body and there is there's overwhelming scientific data confirming that exercise improves the health and longevity of human beings. In the same way, intermittent fasting can trigger autophagy and has potential health benefits, as summarized in this article right here in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most prestigious medical journals in the entire world. So it is kind of like the opposite of medical hypotheses, where any moron can publish whatever piece of shit article they want, provided they fork over the 1500 bucks needed to get it published. Anyways, one of the effects of intermittent fasting is to increase autophagy as seen in this figure from the New England Journal article right here. Intermittent fasting as well as some drugs that increase autophagy are even being looked at right now as we speak as possible anti-aging techniques that could expand the lifespan of human beings. Personally speaking, I will occasionally engage in intermittent fasting as I find it is good for appetite control. I am one of those eaters who has a bottomless pit when it comes to any kind of food, so if I just ate all throughout the day whenever I wanted to, I would probably end up looking like Jason Blaha. So having a shorter feeding window for me helps me keep my weight under control. Now, I'm not a hardcore adherent to it, so at most maybe I'll fast 18 hours between meals, but only sporadically. If anyone is interested in trying it, I'd probably recommend starting with something simple like just skipping breakfast or so, so that will be roughly a 12 hour fast, so you eat about four hours after getting up. I wouldn't recommend any of these really crazy long fasts because it would be difficult to adhere to long term, and also it's important to remember that intermittent fasting is not the same thing as starvation. Fasting longer is not always better, and if you fast for too long, eventually it's no longer fasting. It becomes starvation, which will cause the breakdown of skeletal and smooth muscle tissue, which can cause physical weakness, as well as many, many health problems. So yeah, autophagy is all well and good, but the name of this channel is Hair Cafe, not Immortality Cafe. So what does this autophagy stuff have to do with hair loss, you may wonder? Well, as it turns out, surprisingly, autophagy is critical to the hair growth cycle and to hair growth in general. So just to review all this, there are three main phases of the hair cycle. There is the antigen growth phase, where the hair is healthy and growing, and this lasts for at least two years and often a lot longer. Next is the catagen transition phase, where the hair follicle shrinks down and the hair stops growing. This lasts just a few weeks. There is then the telogen resting phase, where the hair just sits there waiting to fall out, and this lasts about three months. After this, the antigen phase starts over again. In androgenic alopecia, the antigen growth phase shortens and the hair grows back abnormally, becoming weaker, thinner, and smaller with each hair cycle. What finasteride does is that it blocks the formation of the trash hormone DHT and makes the hair cycle more like what you would see in someone who doesn't have androgenic alopecia. So getting back to autophagy and the hair cycle, there is a study from 2018 that is titled, quote, 
Autophagy is essential for maintaining the growth of a human mini-organ, evidence from scalp hair follicle organ culture, unquote. In this study, the investigators found a way to stain cultured human hair follicles with a fluorescent dye that attaches to proteins associated with autophagy. Specifically, they were able to tag a protein called LC3, which you can see here is involved in the autophagy process. So, from the study, here is an example of a hair follicle where the red spots are areas of autophagy. To make sure these red dots were due to autophagy, the investigators added chloroquine, which is an anti-malarial drug that is similar to hydroxychloroquine. And yes, I know what you guys are thinking right now, but no. No fucking way am I bringing that subject up ever again. So let's move on. Anyways, chloroquine blocks the autophagy process downstream from the LC3 step. So actually with chloroquine, there is an accumulation of what are called autophagosomes, which are produced by autophagy. And here in this figure right, that you can see right here, you can see that indeed the number of red dots increased with chloroquine. So the investigators hypothesized that during the antigen growth phase, there has to be a lot of autophagy going on. This may be because hair actually grows faster than any tumor, so this is a stressful process for the hair follicles and stress induces autophagy. So during the antigen growth phase of the hair follicle, there has to be a lot of autophagy, and indeed, that's what they found. In this figure here, you can see on the left that the number of autophagy red dots in the antigen phase is a lot more than the number of autophagy red dots in the catagen phase on the right here. This graph here shows that autophagy decreases in the catagen phase compared to the antigen phase. So this may all sound a bit confusing, so let me use my hair loss witcher senses to clarify all this. During the antigen growth phase, there's a lot of autophagy going on in the hair follicle cells, but during the catagen phase, autophagy decreases tremendously. This implies that you need autophagy to keep the hair in the antigen growth phase. Now, I know what you're all thinking right now, but Kevin, aren't you the one who always says correlation doesn't equal causation? Use a hypocrite, bro. Well, bear with me here, Chooms, because as it turns out, the investigators did some other experiments to show that this change in the autophagy was not just something simply correlated with the catagen phase, but it actually is what triggers the catagen phase. What the investigators did is that they gave an inhibiting RNA molecule to silence the gene ATG5, which is a gene critical for autophagy. When they did this to the antigen phase hairs, the hairs immediately shut down the antigen phase and went right into the catagen transition phase. As the investigators note, quote, experimental autophagy inhibition prematurely terminates antigen and promotes apoptosis driven development, unquote. So when they're talking about this, what they're talking about is that inhibiting autophagy causes the antigen phase to transition into the catagen phase, which is a bad thing since that means an earlier transition into the telogen resting phase when the hair follicles don't grow. By the same token, increasing autophagy should prolong the antigen growth phase. So the investigators tested a substance they called core mix, which contained N1-methylspermidine, which is a chemical which increases autophagy. Anyways, as you can see here in the three sets of cultured human hair follicles that were given this stuff, the percentage of follicles in the antigen growth phase increased compared to the control group. After suppressing the autophagy gene ATG5, the treatment had no effect, suggesting that stimulating autophagy was the cause of the improved percentage of hairs in the antigen growth phase. Well, that's all very interesting, but let's move on from cultured hair follicles to the next step in most research, and that next step is another goddamn mouse study. In this study, titled, quote, Stimulation of Hair Growth by Small Molecules that activate autophagy, unquote. The investigators shaved the skin off mice when the hair of the mice was in the telogen resting phase. Keep in mind, though, that in young mice, unlike in humans, the hair growth cycle is synchronized all across the mouse. So all the hair on the mouse is in the same growth phase at the same time, unlike in human beings where it is random all over the scalp. Also, mice in nature are colored gray or black. They are not white like lab mice. So with normally colored mice, the hair in the antigen phase is very dark colored so you can get a good idea idea of how much antigen hair a mouse has just by looking at the color of its hairs. Anyways, these investigators tested several substances that affected autophagy in these shaved mice. For example, they tested something called alpha-ketoglutarate, or alpha-KG, which is a substance in the body that's manufactured during fasting periods and is known to increase autophagy. If you look at this figure here, you can see that with the alpha-KG, the mice quickly went from the telogen resting phase into the antigen growth phase. The graph on the right shows the increase in hair pigmentation with the alpha-KG that goes 
goes along with these mice more rapidly going into the antigen growth phase compared with the control mice. So it looks like increasing autophagy can activate the antigen growth phase and decreasing autophagy terminates the antigen growth phase and brings on the catagen intelligent resting phases of the hair cycle. So simply put, more autophagy means more hair growth, and less autophagy means hair loss. The investigators did some other experiments to show which proteins were involved in this autophagy process, but it's not all that important to go into these details. It's interesting to note, though, that they did find that some known stimulants of autophagy, including the antibiotics oligomycin and rapamycin, and also the diabetes drug metformin, all induced hair regeneration in these mice, while the drug autophinib, which is known to stop autophagy, prevented hair hair regeneration. Metformin in particular is very interesting because it is currently being investigated as an anti-aging drug due to the fact that it promotes autophagy, but I am absolutely not encouraging anyone to consume any of these drugs thinking that it is going to promote hair growth. As of now, this is theoretical, and all of these drugs have significant side effects. However, these drugs could lay the foundation for more specific autophagy-inducing drugs that could be used to treat hair loss and other age-related conditions. All this research is preliminary, but I do anticipate autophagy drugs being huge beneficiaries in helping stop and reverse diseases associated with aging, including hair loss, since hair loss does get worse as you get older. So, autophagy is definitely important for healthy hair growth, but the question is, is abnormal autophagy a process associated with androgenic alopecia? Well, that question brings us to the last study we'll cover today. It's titled, quote, Impairment of autophagy may be associated with follicular miniaturization and androgenetic alopecia by inducing pre mature catagen, unquote. In the study, the authors note that there are three main features of androgenic alopecia. Number one, terminal hairs convert into small vellus hairs. Number two, the hair cycle is shortened. And number three, eventually there is degradation of the hair follicles. The end result is a shiny, slick, bald scalp accompanied by a toilet seat-shaped ring of hair. Basically, it's just a sign that your life is over. In androgenic alopecia, the hair follicles spend an increasing amount of time in the telogen and catagen phases, and the percent of of hairs in the antigen growth phase decreases dramatically. The trigger to all this is, of course, the trash hormone DHT in people who are genetically predisposed to androgenic alopecia. That is why DHT-lowering drugs like finasteride and dutasteride work to stop hair loss. So, the investigators propose that in androgenic alopecia, antigen ends early and an early catagen phase develops that results in the miniaturization of the hair follicles, as you can see in this figure right here. The investigators cultured hair follicles from balding scalps of men with androgenic alopecia, and they compared these to normal hair follicles. The investigators found that autophagy was decreased in both miniaturized catagen phase hairs and normal catagen hairs, but the genes responsible for autophagy were more down-regulated in the miniaturized hair versus the normal hair follicles. In addition, the investigators found increased apoptosis in these abnormal hairs. Apoptosis is programmed cell death, and it happens normally during the catagen phase, but it looks like it happens even more when hairs are miniaturized and this was due to the decreased autophagy in these hairs. The investigators then gave them something called 3-methyladenine, or 3-MA, which inhibits autophagy. They found that 3-MA shortened the antigen phase and induced catagen, as well as increasing apoptosis. The 3-MA also slowed hair growth, as you can see here, and it also increased the proportion of hairs in the catagen phase versus the antigen phase. The investigators concluded that in androgenic alopecia, there are changes in the activation of genes that control autophagy so that there is decreased autophagy, which leads to premature catagen and increased apoptosis, resulting in hair follicle miniaturization. So most, if not all the features of androgenic alopecia can be explained by abnormal autophagy. So some of you may be writing in the comments section right now, but Kevin, if stress can be good for the hair, how come stress can cause telogen effluvium, which is a form of hair loss? You'd be wrong, bro. I'm going to get my hair loss advice from Danny Roddy from now on. Well... Like I said before, intermittent fasting may be good for you, but starvation certainly is not good for you. In the same context, a little bit of stress can stimulate autophagy, which in turn could stimulate hair growth, but if you have extreme stress, autophagy can't keep up with that, and so you end up terminating the antigen growth phase of the hair cycle, and you end up with more hairs in the telogen resting phase, and then shed as a consequence of telogen effluvium. If just everyday stress caused hair loss, then everything would cause hair loss. It's only extreme stress, such as crash dieting, traumatic injury, PTSD, and surgery that can cause telogen effluvium. Minor stress, on the other hand, may actually benefit hair growth since it triggers autophagy.
So, what can we conclude from all this data? Certainly we can conclude that autophagy is important for the normal hair growth cycle and that abnormalities of autophagy may contribute to the shortening of the antigen phase as well as the miniaturization of hairs in people with androgenic alopecia. The genes that regulate autophagy may be some of the genes that contribute to androgenic alopecia and maybe the disordered autophagy in the hair follicles is also abnormal elsewhere in the body, explaining why androgenic alopecia is also associated with other diseases such as heart heart disease, and Parkinson's disease, and I actually did a video about that which I'll link below. But the good news is that there are already drugs that can stimulate autophagy, though they still need to be tested in human beings in order to see if they are safe and effective in promoting hair growth. We know that intermittent fasting promotes autophagy, but there hasn't been any large-scale research testing whether intermittent fasting can promote hair growth, but we know it does promote autophagy, so theoretically at least, maybe it can promote hair growth. We do have some preliminary research in mice that fasting promotes hair follicle growth, so it's certainly is possible that the same effects may occur in humans, but of course, more testing is needed. So this is all pretty recent research, and there are no studies in actual human beings, but I expect we're going to see a lot more research on this in the very near future, not just for hair loss, but also just anti-aging in general. In the meantime, I definitely wouldn't throw away the finasteride minoxidil just yet, but occasionally skipping a meal probably does have some health benefits, and it might even help your hair. It's worth a shot at least. So, alright, chooms, until next time, I'll see you guys soon, and I promise it won't take 10 days this time. Take care.